coming to MRI. Remember diffusion variant imaging is considered to be the best imaging modality for patients who are suffering from acute ischemic stroke. We know that MRI is going to be time consuming, but only if you do all the sequences, it's going to be time consuming. You're going to do T1, T2, FLAR, DWA, ADC. If you do all the sequences, it's going to be definitely time consuming. But if you do only DWA sequences, I've already told you the time taken for doing DWA alone is going to be comparable to that of the time taken for NCCD. So you can go ahead if it's institutional and if you have a 24 by 7 radiologist, then what's stopping you for going towards MRI? It's better to do an MRI itself instead of NCCT. But for all practical purposes, according to the current guidelines, first investigation is always NCCT only. And remember, diffusion variant imaging will show defect within the first few minutes of acute stroke. We're going to see something called as diffusion restriction. And areas of diffusion restriction are going to appear bright, visibly bright. Even a non radiologist can easily identify this. It's not a problem. And whenever you have a restricted diffusion in DWI, that indicates a core infarct, which means it's a dead tissue, even though this is highly questionable according to the latest studies. But for now, let us understand it's a core infarct, it's a dead area. And usually, the diffusion variant intensity will reach a peak by approximately 7 days mark and then it will remain positive for 3 weeks even though after 7 days it will start gradually coming down but it will remain positive up to 3 weeks. By around 1 month mark there might be something called a pseudo normalization and after that uh, your diffusion rate imaging will not be reliable for telling whether the patient had a stroke or not. But in the hyperacute and acute phases DW is very very reliable in picking up ischemic stroke. And remember, in cortical strokes, the diffusion variant imaging abnormality will be there for approximately three weeks. But for spinal cord strokes, it is estimated that the abnormality will persist for only one week. Apparent diffusion coefficient, that is otherwise called as ADC, can be considered as a brother of your diffusion variant imaging. Because this is also something that's going to pick up your areas of restricted diffusion only. But only difference is it's going to show low signal instead of high signal in DWI. And the low signal in ADC is going to reach a peak by approximately 24 hours and it continues to remain positive for at least 7 days where around 7 to 8 days mark uh, there can be a kind of pseudo normalization and after that the signal starts steadily increasing and it becomes bright in the chronic stage. Flare is also equally important and there is a renewed interest in flare especially after the wake up trial because we know that flare starts to become abnormal by around 6 hours mark. So if you have an abnormal diffusion variant imaging, but a normal flare, this is called as DWA flare mismatch. And this clearly tells, if this is the case, this clearly tells that the stroke must be less than 4.5 hours to 6 hours old. And this is especially useful for patients who are presenting with an unknown last interval or patients who are presenting with wake-up strokes because these patients can be potential candidates for thrombolysis and clearly your wake-up trial have proven benefit and you can consider thrombolysis in these individuals with DWA flare mismatch especially if your endovascular therapy is supposed to be delayed and let us come back to the table in a while let us finish off this graph first you can see what are the abnormalities in uh, T2 weighted sequence or flare imaging so usually your T2 weighted imaging abnormality will start by around 6 to 24 hours only but it will be very subtle. But flare sequence abnormality starts by around 6 hours itself. And the signal consistently increases after 6 to 24 hours. And in the chronic stage, it persists to be abnormal. Because in the chronic stage, you are going to encounter cystic encephalomalacia, which is nothing but fluid with CSF density. And of course, it's a T2-weighted sequence and water will be bright. So CSF is going to be bright. And hence, your uh, areas of cystic encephalomalacia is also going to be bright. So it's more useful for identifying old strokes. And then coming to DWA. Uh, the diffusion weighted imaging abnormality will start within minutes of onset of ischemic stroke, where it's going to show bright signals. And the signal intensity slowly increases and reaches a peak by around 5 to 7 days, generally by 7 days mark. And then the signal intensity will drop by around 2 to 4 weeks marks, especially at 30 days. Uh, there can be a kind of pseudo normalization where you can see no change in the DWI. And after that, in chronic strokes, 
know, like you cannot uh, reliably depend on your DWA for detecting the changes. And ADC changes will start again within minutes of onset of ischemic stroke. And the low signal reaches a peak by approximately 24 hours. And slowly the low signal drops and you can encounter sort of pseudo normalization by approximately 7 to 8 days. And after that the signal slowly starts increasing and ADC is definitely going to show bright signals in patients with chronic strokes. And now let us see the table. In the hyperacute phase, the main uh, reason for obtaining changes in MRI is going to be cytotoxic edema. DWI, definitely high signal, ADC, corresponding low signal, and you're not going to see any changes in the first six hours in T1, T2 or flare imaging. And in the acute phase, which lasts from six to 24 hours, where there'll be a vasogenic edema, your DWI continues to show high signal. In fact, it's going to increase further and ADC will show low signal. And T1 weighted imaging, T2 weighted imaging and flare is going to show abnormality, starting to show abnormality at this point. And flare definitely will show abnormality by around six to seven hours mark. And this is very important because we need to find out DWA flare mismatch to determine whether the patient is a candidate for thrombolysis or not in selected group of individuals, especially if EVT is delayed. And that's why flare is more important in this setting. And then coming to the subacute phase, which lasts from one to seven days, where uh, the etiology of changes is going to be edema and infarction will be complete at this point. And DWI continues to increase and usually reaches a peak by this point. And ADC may become completely normal by seven days. I told you there can be pseudo normalization at this point. And uh, T1 weighted imaging, T2 weighted imaging and flare sequence continue to show changes, even though these are not very important at this point. And in chronic strokes, which are more than one month old, here the edema would have resolved and there will be onset of gliosis and the patient will go for cystic encephalomalacia because of liquefactor necrosis. And here DWA is not reliable. It can be normal or it can be variable or it can show slightly lower signals also. And ADC is very reliable at this point where it will show consistently high signals. And T2 is also very reliable. It's going to show consistently high signals. And T1 continues to show low signal and flare is not reliable at this point where it can be normal or it can slightly show a low signal also. So what's going to happen in acute and hyperacute strokes, you're going to have a high signal in DWI and low signal in ADC. That's all, nothing much. In chronic strokes, you're going to have a high signal in ADC and high signal in T2 weighted imaging where your flare changes and diffusion weighted imaging changes will be variable and T1 will show low signal. That's it. So this is how you find out whether it's an acute or hyperacute stroke or a chronic stroke based on MRI. And as I've told you, there could be something called a pseudo normalization, especially in diffusion weighted imaging, similar to CT fogging that can happen by approximately 10 to 15 days, typically happens around 30 days according to theory where you can see a completely normal division weight imaging. This patient has a posterior circulation stroke in the right PCA territory where there's nothing in the division weight sequence by approximately around 10 to 15 days mark where flare shows a little abnormality. On the other hand, your uh, T1 gadolinium enhanced sequence is clearly showing abnormality which is consistent with the diagnosis of ischemic stroke. So that is why whenever you have CT fogging or uh, pseudo normalization of division weight imaging, the confirmatory sequence will be gadolinium enhanced T1 weighted sequence which will surely show abnormality in the form of gadolinium enhancement. And then coming to the importance of other imaging modalities. First is the CT angiography or MR angiography. The most important thing I told you thousands of times it is to identify large vessel occlusion. If you have a large vessel occlusion you can consider endovascular therapy. If you do not have a large vessel occlusion these, can, these patients will not be candidates for endovascular therapy and most patients will be undergoing CT angiography in the first six hours itself even though delayed presentations you can still take but CT angiography is most useful in the first six hours to determine the candidacy for endovascular therapy and we do have some other imaging modalities like diffusion weighted imaging, MR perfusion imaging and CT perfusion imaging as well and why we need all these imaging modalities is to understand how big 
the dead tissue that is the infect volume is and how big or how small the salvageable penumbra is and we want to find out is there any mismatch between the amount of dead tissue and the salvageable penumbra and we'll be discussing that in a while and this data will definitely help us guiding patients towards endovascular therapy especially if they're presenting late beyond six hours and currently using this data you can take the patients for EVT up to 24 hours for anti-circulation stroke and up to 48 hours for post-circulation stroke. Even though according to guidelines, especially based on DAWN results, you can take the patients for approximately up to 24 hours after the onset of ischemic stroke. And according to textbooks and theory, TWA and MR perfusion imaging is more sensitive, 95% sensitive in the first few hours of stroke compared to CT perfusion imaging, which is only 80% sensitive because it's logical that CTP and CT tends to miss out on very small strokes and small lacunes. And this is not relevant practically because I'm not going to do a CTP or MRP in the first uh, few hours of stroke. And the usefulness of CTP and MRP will be more only if the patient is presenting late beyond 6 hours for now. And the first 6 hours, I'm not going to do this imaging at all. And all I want in the first 6 hours is to see whether the patient is having a large vessel occlusion or not. That can be done with the help of CT angiography itself. So the role of your DWI, MRP and CTP in the first six hours is completely unclear. And majority of the current guidelines suggest you don't need to do CTP or MRP in the first six hours. Remember, but again, if a patient is having large vessel occlusion, both these modalities are comparable. And these are the patients who are going to be targeted for endovascular therapy. And again, so this differences in sensitivity is not going to make a much difference. That's what my final take home point is. And what is the rationale behind doing these investigations and understanding how big or how small the penumbra is? That is based on whether the patient is a slow progressor or a fast progressor. For example, if the patient is having a good collateral supply and if the tissue resistance ischemia is high, this patient will generally be a slow progressor because the number of neurons lost per minute in these patients will be less than 35,000 and the rate of infarct growth will be less than 5 ml per hour. And in fact, the slow progressors are the most common form of population. 1 in 2 will be slow progressor only. And in these patients, because the infarct growth rate is slow, even if they present late, there will be a small infarct core and there will be a huge salvageable penumbra because there will be a lot of neurons which will be still alive but ischemic and can be salvaged. On the other hand, if you see fast progresses, this patient will be having poor collaterals in general which I have discussed already and their tissue resistance ischemia will also be low and see the amount of neurons that is lost, it's more than 27 million per minute and the infarct growth rate is going to be rapid at more than 12 ml per hour and uh, generally fast progress are not that common only one in four will be fast progresses and these patients will be having a big core at the time of presentation itself very early in the course of the disease and they will be having a small salvageable penumbra so these patients generally will not be candidates for endovascular therapy especially if they are presenting late beyond six hours so this is the basis of our your CT perfusion or MR perfusion imaging to understand how big or how small the penumbra is.